Hey everyone, it's Marvin. Thanks so much for listening to Books and Boba. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick second to remind you that Books and Boba just launched our Patreon uh, to help support our future endeavors. Rira and I have been running Books and Boba for the last six and a half years, and we've always talked about wanting to do more, um, including expanding our content offerings, um, being able to go to book events and do more coverage. And so um, to help us get closer to those ambitions, um, we started a Patreon to help us grow and to better support books by Asian and Asian American authors. We are offering two tiers for our Patreon. Um, the first is our regular Boba member coming in at $3 a month, which will give you access to our brand new Books and Boba Discord server so you can engage with your fellow Books and Boba Club members and also Rira and myself in real time. Uh, this is where we'll be aiming to move the bulk of our book club discussions. Uh, but rest assured, we'll still have a presence on Goodreads as well. And our premium tier is our Honey Boba member tier coming in at $5 dollars a month where in addition to access to our discord server you'll also get access to our monthly boba chats a bonus podcast where rira and i and some guests will get together each month and have a a more casual discussion on stuff that may or may not be book related as well as answer some listener q a honey boba members will also have access to a poll to help decide an official books and boba book pick uh, once per quarter so if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, support Books and Boba on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash books and boba. As always, we and I really appreciate your support. All right. Thanks for listening. And I'm on with the show. You're listening to Whoa. Hot Luck. Hot luck. And welcome to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Ri Rayu. And welcome to our first book club discussion of 2021. We're discussing our January 2021 book club pick, The Magical Language of Others by E.J. Ko. But before we get to the book, Rira, how has your 2021 been going? Um... I mean, we we talk about this a lot, how time is just like a flat circle, and <laughs> it just feels like January has flown by. Um, it has, even though, I mean, wasn't there a coup <laughs> during January? Wasn't there Yeah, yeah, a lot of things happened politically, obviously, but um, I don't know, like, everything kind of feels like a fever dream, and... Uh, with the vaccine situation, the like it's it's just been constant change. Did you uh, see that anti vaxxer shut down at a vaccination site? No, I, I did not hear about that. <laughs> yeah. What I did hear about was um how we have a how how we have like a vaccine shortage for like more than half of the country and that there's like a new variant of um the COVID nineteen strain. Yeah, it's gotten really bad. And it's like a question of of like, will the vaccine be able to stop uh, the symptoms of the new strains? And I don't know, like, I, I'm trying to stay as calm as possible. I've been staying at home as much as I can, um, considering that, like, now, like, COVID has been happening on the outskirts of my inner circle. So it's just like, I'm just, I, I'm just like, people, please stay home, because now, now it's like right outside my doorstep and yeah. I'm kind of terrified at this point. Oh, well, we're here today to talk about our January 2021 book club pick. Um, so let's get to it. Um, as always, as always, we're going to talk all about the book, um, The Magical Language of Others. So if you haven't read it yet, read it first if you don't want to get spoiled. Um, but if you want to listen to us first and then read it, then that's fine too. You do you. And I would like to give out the trigger warnings of um, of eating eating disorder, uh, suicidal thoughts. Um, I guess like child neglect. <laughs> <laughs> um, this there's a lot of um, sensitive topics in in this book, so I would proceed with caution if if you are um, sensitive to those topics. All right, so let's get started. Uh, Rira, why don't you start us off with the book jacket description? 
All right. The Magical Language of Others is a powerful and aching love story in letters from mother to daughter. After living in America for over a decade, Unji Ko's parents returned to South Korea for work, leaving 15-year-old Unji and her brother behind in California. Overnight, Unji finds herself abandoned and adrift in a world made strange by her mother's absence. Her mother writes letters in Korean over the years seeking forgiveness and love, letters Unji cannot fully understand until she finds them years later hidden in a box. As Unji translates the letters, she looks to history, her grandmother June's ears as a lovesick wife in Tejon, the horrors her grandmother Kumiko witnessed during the Jeju Island Massacre, and to poetry as well as her own lived experience to answer questions inside all of us. So, right off the bat, I figure, I mean, I really enjoyed reading this book. Um, I'm not like a literally trained person, but... Um, EJ's prose is really beautiful, very descriptive, you know, very, I guess there's a lot of stuff going on and a lot of really like beautiful descriptions. But I know that because I am a son of immigrants and not a daughter and especially (laughs) (laughs) not a daughter of a Korean immigrant, I know that your relation to this story might be a little more deeper than than mine. But um, what did you how did you feel about this book? Oh, man, I how do I even answer that question is... uh... (laughs) Um, I knew that I I knew going in that this memoir was going to be very difficult for me to read. Um, I'm a very emotional reader. uh, For those of you who haven't been listening to our podcast for (laughs) for a a while. Um, But when I memoirs are supposed to be personal, and it's supposed to tell the story of um, the author. But for me, when I was reading EJ Ko's book, it seemed like she was holding up a mirror, I guess, um, instead of her, instead of just like listening and consuming her story. It felt like I was seeing kind of like this dis- this distorted reflection of my own childhood and my own adulthood. Um, and like you said, like her prose is really gorgeous. Um, I think that has a lot to do with the fact that she is a poet and she knows how to use each word to its maximum effect. Um, just like an example of her poetic prose, I, I have like highlighted a quote from her. Um, I watched the sun come up like an egg cracked open underwater, its yolk rising with listlessness. Uh, so you have a lot of uh, beautiful prose like that, very vivid, very uh, painter-like. But just to give a... I, I don't think I can talk about this book without talking about my own personal experience because that is just like how (laughs) this book affected me i mean that's Um, how poetry works too right yeah that's how (laughs) poetry works too um i'm not a big fan of poetry um which is probably why we have not read poetry in this podcast simply because i'm also not a literary trained person so i like it is intimidating to uh, read a poem <laughs> yeah. and analyze it, and uh, we'll get into more of like her poetry, um, like because she has like a whole arc related to like poetry and how it saved her and how it helped her come to forgiveness and all of that. Um, but uh, Unji, her parents left her at fifteen years old. Uh, they left because of a lucrative job opportunity that would provide her parents with elite status. So they could live in a condo, they have like luxury cars, they can go to department stores with like pretty much a black card and uh, their education would be paid for. So this is a very big opportunity and um, it's a contracted opportunity. So her dad, his original contract is for three years in Korea. And uh, the understanding is that, like, after three years, they'll come back to America and, you know, be reunited with their family. Uh, For me, it is, like, my life has kind of been the opposite. Uh, My dad came to America based on a contract. And um, my family joined him a year after his first year of starting the contract, And I don't know how long the contract was supposed to be. I think it was like maybe five years. 
But uh, I came to this country when I was three. So they originally thought that after a couple of years, we'll go back to Korea and I'll, you know, be in elementary school in in Korea and uh, grow up there. But the contract kept getting extended. And, you know, my family stayed here for pretty much 11 years, I I would say. So around the same time as like how Unji's family was living in, in California, So um, I've been in this country for like 11 years. So I'm like 14 years old at this time, 14 or 15 years old. And um, my dad gets a promotion and it requires him to go back to Korea. And it's the same situation where if we had gone, we would have lived very, very comfortably. And um, my dad's salary would have been like much higher it's funny because like Unji's parents are are like, okay, we're going to go and you'll stay in America because like your, your age kind of makes it difficult to, to adapt in Korea. And, um, and for like my family, it was the opposite. They were like, oh no, you're coming no matter what. Uh, I didn't really have a choice in that matter, but um, I kind of came up with, with um, not a PowerPoint presentation, but I I, like, I was just like, I'm not going to Korea. If you want to go to Korea, you can go by yourselves. I'm staying in America. These are the reasons why I will apply to boarding school or a homestay program. At the time, homestay programs were really popular amongst amongst Koreans where uh, the child would stay with like a Korean American family and then they would still continue to go to high school uh, while their family is working abroad. So I presented all these solutions to pretty much be separated from my family. <laughs> Whereas with Unji, wow. it's the complete opposite, right? Like she, you know, like once her parents leave, she feels adrift and she feels uh, like her parents have abandoned her and um, she has a hard time hard time with school. She She skips school and she comes back after... Um, after a certain number of hours pass so that her brother doesn't know that she hadn't gone to school and she develops an eating disorder. So obviously, like, her mother's absence has impacted her in a very, in, in like, a very negative way. Whereas with me, it was, it was very, very different for me. <laughs> uh, so, so like I said, like, reading this book, it was looking at how my life could have been if my parents had decided to leave and I stayed, uh, would I have felt abandoned? Would have would I have felt their absence in a very painful way? Uh, would I have adapted to school by myself? Like, what would I have done with this freedom? It it's a very it was a very emotional read for me throughout the entire book. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was another variation of that as well. Like. Um, my parents came to America because my dad was looking for work. Um, as we were growing up, he you know worked a lot of retail jobs. He did import exports, so he would take business trips that would take months. So basically, he would leave for two to three months and come back for like half a year, then leave again for two to three months. And then once China opened up its borders for trade again, he found more opportunities as as someone who was familiar with international trade and who is also you know fluent in Chinese to go to China and like search for business there because there were business opportunities there. And all of a sudden that, that ratio was switched where he would come home for a month or two and then spend the rest of the time in China. So um, I kind of grew up with my dad leaving for long periods of time um, but my mom decided to stay, at least until both my brother and I were in college. So we didn't get the full, you know, latchkey immigrant kid experience because my mom was still there. But we did get used to, you know, parents being absent. And I think the difference between myself and Unji is that this happened to me starting in elementary school. So when I was like six or seven, as opposed to like starting when I was like in high school, um, which I think... Change is much more difficult to handle when you're that age, I think, because of, I don't know, because of puberty or adolescence or just heightened emotions as a teenager. I think it also has to do with the fact that, like, when you're in elementary school, um, change is happening all over. Whereas with, like, when you're a teenager, there has been, like, a sense of self that has been solidified. So when, like, a big change, like, your parents 
moving out of the country happens, uh, it really does destabilize you. Um, there's a quote in in the book um, that kind of talks about that. Uh, Children have no concept that every moment comes to end, but rather feel as though their suffering at present will last for an eternity. And I think that really has to do with uh, your adolescence years and, and teen years. Not so much when you're like five or six years old. You'll kind of forget. That's true. Because I remember things in high school feeling like there was the biggest deal in the world. And now that I look back, like that wasn't a big deal at all. Yeah. So um, I I had borrowed this book uh, from the library, um, but it was an audio book. And I thought, well, well, Unji narrates her memoir. So I was like, okay, well, this will be good enough. Like I will hear her voice. And, you know, she's a poet. So she's very good at reading her words and delivering the meaning. But then like after the first chapter, I read like, she was reading a letter that her mother had written her, but it was in English. And I had heard that she actually scanned her mother's letters into the book. So I was like, okay, well, I like I can read Korean. My my Korean isn't like super great, but it is a lot better than than most Korean Americans. So I was like, okay, I need to read her mother's letters because things will get lost in translation. And there is so much you can read from um, from your handwriting and from like Korean terms that you can't fully translate. So when I read her mother's letters, it really reminded me a lot about my own mom because my mom also talks in third person. Actually, a lot of Korean moms talk in third person. I think so. Asian moms in general do that because my mom also does that. Yeah. Like, refers to herself as mommy. It's weird because like her... Um, it doesn't really translate to mommy, but Unji, uh, she translated it to mommy because that is how she always um, defined the term omma. With mm. me, it's just mom. And it's just, you know, it's not like a kiddish title. It's it's just right. what my mom is. Yeah. Omma. I mean, in my specific subculture of Chinese, the familiar name for mom is literally mommy. And then dad is babi. So I, mean, I guess we have it just like a more formal. <laughs> we have like more formal titles. Like omoni means mother, so that's mm. like way formal. Oh well, um, yeah, that's yeah for for Chinese that's muqing. Or, yeah, yeah. But like reading her mother's letters in her handwriting, uh, her handwriting is very girlish, very young, um, and just like there's like doodles on her mother's letters uh they're very cute and um and like the like i kind of like i kind of laughed when i read some of the english translations that she wrote uh next to difficult korean terms um because it's not 100 percent accurate <laughs> but but it's like you have like the sense of fondness because it's like oh you actually tried like you picked up a dictionary and you uh, made the effort so that your words could um, could deliver what you're trying to say, even though it's it's not going to land 100. Um, percent I know that a lot of people who read the letters said her mom is terrible. She's very narcissistic. She's talking about like how she's having such a great time in Korea with her family and is so oblivious to her daughter's pain. Uh, but for me, I didn't read it like that. And I don't know if it's, if it's because my mom is Korean and is very similar to Unji's mom. Not all Korean moms are the same, by the way. <laughs> um, but like with my mom, um, she she tends to like brag about like what is happening in her life. Um, but she also like switches pretty quickly into like, like, I'm depressed. I'm sad. This is what's. Like, I've sacrificed so much for you, blah, 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 blah. And when, like, all of the happy, fluffy stuff happens in Unji's mom's letters, it just kind of seems like a facade to me. Like, trying to tell her daughter, like, I'm having a good time, so you should live your life to the fullest as well. And also trying to, like, I don't know, like, um, kind of make it seem like it is she's kind of justifying her reasons for for like leaving saying like oh well i'm spending time with my sister who i haven't seen for like 14 years or whatever 
And I finally get this chance to, you know, connect with the family that I left behind. So, yeah, to me, it came off as shallow, but also it was um, it was like a way to mask her pain. And I think I think her letters like definitely like she leaves out a lot and you have to glean her feelings and her guilt from what she doesn't write. Yeah, I mean, I definitely got glimpses of guilt in between the the letters. And it's interesting because, like, it's interesting because the letters themselves are overall pretty upbeat and positive as opposed to the more melancholic tone of the actual memoir sections. So I can see why it was jarring for some people because you have this daughter who is going through a hard time while the mother is, yo, everything is cool here. But you're right. Like as a like for myself, as as a son of immigrants, as, as a son of a mother who, you know, my mom, after my brother and I went to college, left to go live with my dad uh, because for what, like 10 years, they were literally separated because of work. But even I can tell that it was hard for her to be away from us. And there's something that only what do you what would you call people like us like reverse parachute kids where like the parents leave <laughs> for like for opportunity but like like there's something that we can understand that our parents didn't leave because they wanted to like they left for us like for the family and even though they're enjoying their lives better than they would have if they stayed here um it doesn't mean that they you know, stop thinking about us or stop caring about us, right? They're still working hard over there. And for some parents, it's like, this is how they show their parental love, right? There's that line that will hit very close to any like Asian kid, right? Any Asian child of immigrants, which is... Oh, I think I know which line you're talking about, but go It was on, better to pay for your children than to stay with them. Yes, <laughs> right? yes. I felt that, like, I like it kicked my heart. <laughs> and... <laughs> It's funny because uh, with Unji, um, I think there's this line where she she's with her mother in Korea, I think. I think it is in Korea. And her mom says, and this is when like the contract ends because her father doesn't renew his contract. And her mom is like, you need to appreciate the sacrifices that your dad has made. He's like worked very hard. He had to like go out drinking with his boss and he's going to have liver failure. Um, aren't you happy that, you know, we're coming back? And Unji says something in her uh, inner monologue saying that, like, she knows how hard her dad worked, but at the same time, she resent his sacrifice. And I think that is something that a lot of Asian American immigrant kids can can understand because, you know, you're a lot of the times like the language barrier will make it very difficult for you to like have i guess heart to heart conversations yeah not just the language barrier but the culture kind of yeah the culture barrier, as well right? so so it's just like you see your parents struggle and you know that they're doing this out of love but at the same time like their absence like you you resent them it's like i know you're doing this for me but also like why can't you stay with me why can't you understand that like i just need you to be there to support me rather than just make money um and it's, the, a, it's a culture cultural difference like you said yeah and the ironic thing is at least this is my assumption is even if they had stayed the relationship probably wouldn't have improved that much because then you'd be annoyed that they're around all the time it's really it, like <laughs> um with with unji you know she has resentment for her parents for for leaving and you know her mom tells her about all of the fun stuff that she's doing with her life and with me it was the opposite because my parents chose to stay and i think like there's a lot of b bad blood between my parents and myself and we have worked out a couple of things but growing up there was this simmering resentment towards me because uh, it was just like, oh, we could have gone, but we stayed for you. So you kind of have to like make up for our sacrifice. And um, and there have been like moments with with my mom. There's something with Korean moms and their daughters that that bond is very turbulent and very, very close at the same time. There have been moments in fights where my mom has has said, like, if we had gone back to Korea, I would have lived like 
a much better life or um, her saying like, oh, I wish we never came to America because, you know, our life would have been much better. And it's the opposite, you know, because yeah. it's my parents resenting me rather than me <laughs> resenting them. I do have a lot of resentment for my parents that is uh, unresolved. But reading this book, it made me feel kind of ashamed of myself oh, no. um, because because like this memoir is about forgiveness. It's about coming to terms that like the past can't be made up. You know, you have to live forward. You have to, instead of sacrifice, let go. And instead of trying to get your point across, you have to like take the time to understand. So there's a lot of empathy and a lot of forgiveness in this memoir. And it seems like, I don't know what Unji's life is like now, but it seems like she has come to some sort of peace with with her her parents and her past and past resentments. But I'm not there yet. So, <laughs> so when I was reading this book, I was like, oh, I wish I could get to that point of letting go and having um, having peace. But like I said, like, I'm not there yet. So it did make me feel bad. But also I mean... <laughs> at the same time, it made me think that it's possible. I don't know how much older Unji is uh, compared to me, but it's like, I'll get there at some point, <laughs> or at least I hope I get there at some point. Yeah, I mean, that's a successful book, right? <laughs> Something that can let you reflect on your own life. And like I said, I can empathize with the mother-daughter relationship, but I don't have that with my mom. I have a mother-son relationship, which I imagine is a little different. But I'm glad to hear that you had such a, I guess that would be a positive reaction to the book, right? I would say I would say it's an, it, it's an optimistic <laughs> reaction to the book. I actually thought that I would break down crying reading this book because of so many like um I get like it's not really parallels like I said it's like complete opposite. Um right. but I was just like oh I'm going to probably break down crying because you know like I'm kind of at a place where things are unresolved whereas like with her it's a complete story. Um but at, but I didn't cry. Um I felt all of her words very deeply. I felt her pain and I understood it. And um, I really admired her efforts to um, empathize. And the fact that she even like put in the work to translate 49 letters. Yeah. I can't imagine like how painful that must have been because you're reliving your childhood. But at the same time, there's enough distance that you have perspective. And, um, you know, she wasn't good at Korean before, but now as an adult, she's a translator. So she's able to um, see the meaning behind her mother's words or the meaning behind the absence of some of her words. And I was just I was just like, I I don't know if I could do that to myself. I don't know <laughs> if I could um, like if my mom had a diary, for example, I don't think I can go through and read it. Um, I don't know much about my family's history, but like for her to um, dig into her grandmother's histories from both sides and to read about the violence that happened and uh, the depression and also just like the struggles that they had and to trace that trauma and understand her mother more of like how she became the person that she is today. Um, it takes a lot of bravery and it takes a lot of empathy. And I really admired her efforts for it. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we talked about this, I think, when we talked about Pachinko, like what, years ago now? But sometimes we forget as kids who grew up in the States is our grandparents grew up in a time when it was just constant war. If you weren't at war with Japan, you were at war with each other, right? Like both China and Korea had to deal with both the invasion of the Japanese empire and the subsequent you know, civil war brought on by the conflict between United States capitalism and Soviet communism, right? And even our parents, both South Korea and like for myself, for Taiwan, those two places were under martial law until like the late 80s right early 90s like our parents and our grandparents grew up in a very unstable time 
and that also affected how they view the world. I really appreciated the chapters that she dedicated to her grandparents, especially her grandmother Fumiko, which reminded me of like all four of my grandparents have passed away, and so like there's no like I can't go learn about their their past. I have to do that through secondhand sources, like my my father and my mother. And so I kind of know their stories, but I don't know the details from them personally. And that's something that I probably will regret for the rest of my life. But the fact that she took the time to not only document her grandmother's experiences, but like put it down in prose, I think that was really, really amazing. And I learned about the Jeju Island Massacre through this book. I'm sure, you know, for Koreans, it's like a big thing. But it reminded me of like during that time, like at any time you can be accused of being disloyal and like just murdered for like no reason because it was martial law. Yeah. And Jeju Island is 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 kind of different. Like um, mainlanders kind of looked at Jeju Island as like an island for prisoners, you know, Uh they didn't really view the islanders as part of the nation as much as like the other parts of of, of korea um so just like reading that chapter where people are just being accused of of just nothing and just being killed for no reason except for um the soldiers venting out their frustration and making them feel powerful that was really hard to read um and like with from what i understand um it wasn't clear on whether or not kimiko's father was murdered on the streets like that um i i read her acknowledgments and she said um the details are unclear but one thing that was clear was that he was innocent and he got killed. He got murdered. So that is like one creative part of the memoir. And the thing is, like, we hear stories secondhand, like you said. Um, so the details are going to be fuzzy and you have to fill them in yourselves or you have to ask your parents and the details still might be wonky. So there is like there will be some creative um, license to make the story feel cohesive yeah and the chapter on kumiko was i think it was really well done especially because it also paints like even if you're from asia you can still be a perpetual outsider just like she is like when she goes to korea and when she goes to japan like her grandmother was raised as a japanese girl and then they returned to korea by moving to jeju island which is kind of like an enclave for you know Korean for diaspora, women. It, right? Yeah, I mean, like, for uh, the thing that makes Cheju Island special, it's a very matriarchal society with uh, the um, female divers. Uh, they're the ones who provide for the family. Um, and I, I don't know about the diaspora, but um, one thing was clear was... Uh, Kimiko had to erase her Japanese accent. Uh, and when she was in Japan, like her parents had to get rid of their Korean accent. So language definitely has a lot to play with um, how you present your identity and what you have to hide in order to blend in. Yeah. And I think what was really heartbreaking about Grandma Kumiko's story was also that you know, you can see parallels where she was also someone who had a lifelong resentment with her own mother. In her chapter at the end, she comes to peace with her mother's side of it, but not with the anger. Well, there's this running theme of, um, shoot, I forgot like the exact Korean superstition, <laughs> but um, the you become the parent of who you wronged most. You, beca- you become the mo- mother of the daughter that you wronged most or something like that. There- there's like a Buddhist reincarnation concept. <laughs> and therefore, it- it's uncanny with the amount of parallels and the similarities that Unji has with her mother and, um, and how that's just been inherited. Um, we talked a lot about um, her paternal grandmother, uh, Kumiko, but uh, there's also parallelism with her mother's mother, June, uh, because June also 
leaves her family and uh, she struggles with bulimia. And, you know, like her mother tries really hard to get her mother to come back home and she eventually does. Uh, but there, but there is still resentment uh, for leaving in the first place, and and just like the depression that follows, yeah, like the the parallelism is pretty uncanny, and it just goes to show that trauma, <laughs> uh, trauma can be inherited, and <laughs> you know, sans generations. What, uh, uh, yeah, like sans generations, and yeah. you know, like knowing your parents story and how they've been raised and what trauma and what wrongs were done to them you kind of see a complete picture of your parents right yeah. um and you know like at that point it's like you can't blame them for hurting you because they were hurt as well um and i think when the moment you see your parents as humans as people who also went through a lot of pain, I think that's when you become an adult yourself. Because when you're a kid, you're just going to blame your parents for everything. And all the pain that you go through is, it feels like it's going to last forever, like Unji wrote in her book. But seeing how your family history played out, it, it gives you a better understanding, but that anger and resentment can stay. Another chapter that I related to personally is the chapter where um, Unji goes to visit her mother. I think it was right after high school, right, in Korea. And this is probably the first time she visits her mother in Korea um, since they left. And her mother takes her on a like a shopping spree, right? Um, yeah. Like, my family's not as well off as Unji's family in Korea, but I've been on that trip where, you know, your, your parents haven't seen you in a while, so they just want to spoil the crap out of you. But it's not really offering what you need. You know, yeah. Um, I've been on a lot of those shopping sprees. Um, not not strictly with whenever I go to Korea, but um, I don't know. Like, it's it's kind of like how it's money is a love language for a lot of Asian parents, so they try to make up for their absence and for the wrongs that they've done to you with with money um so i've gone on a lot of guilt shopping sprees <laughs> and you know like it's just like both of you know what it is right it's like okay we're gonna we're gonna pretend that everything is okay and that you are being a doting parent and uh you buying me this really expensive jacket is gonna make up for some of the stuff that you've done to me but um yeah like I could definitely relate to that when I was reading <laughs> reading that chapter. And um, I really like the the part of the book where she goes to Japan. Because um, this is before you hear about uh, Unji's paternal grandmother, uh, Kumiko. So, so, like, she goes to Japan, like, when she's, like, 17 for, like, this very extensive uh, language program for for the summer and you know she tells herself i'm not going to go to a restaurant until i can order perfectly in japanese have all of the mannerisms down and as she's staying in japan she you know befriends the people that she interacts with on a daily basis and um i think like a couple of them tell her like are you sure you're korean or american because you act japanese like you must have been Japanese, like in your former life or something, and then it jumps into uh, the story of her paternal grandmother and how she grew up in Japan, and how when she was being raised by her grandmother in in California, she would catch glimpses of like her Japanese, uh, her Japanese ness, and I thought that was just like a very smooth uh, transition. I guess, but yeah, yeah, it was it was very interesting how like how dedicated uh, to the language that uh, Unji was, and it's really weird because you would think that she would go to Korea for like a very extensive language program instead of Japan. Yeah, I guess I didn't put that two together until now, but that is because really it's interesting. like because <laughs> like you, she wasn't very fluent in Korean as a teenager. 
so you would think that she would try to master it at a um master it like after high school and be close to her mom and and stuff like that but she chose japanese so i thought that was a very interesting choice yeah and the chapter on like her going to what i'm assuming is uc irvine um was also really interesting the fact that she took her poetry classes in a trailer classroom and i don't know if they had these at nyu when you went to college but the ucs because we're always under construction a lot of our classes took place in trailers i personally took many classes in trailers um so i was really like it took me back to my college days of like going to (laughs) class in like non-permanent buildings yeah i didn't take classes in trailers at at nyu simply because it's in manhattan and where where are you going to find that um but also nyu is like the greatest real estate holder in manhattan i think columbia was at one point but uh, nyu beat them out (laughs) um (laughs) it's it's the fucking worst um but i've been to like trailer classrooms in in high school because our high school was poor and we didn't have enough classrooms uh, to house like the um, the overpopulation of students. So I, so like it wasn't like I didn't have reference for that. But um, I thought it was really interesting that poetry class was like her mathematics mathematics credit. Like, yeah, who knew academic yeah. advisors had that power? If I had known that, I would have gone to my academic advisor a lot more often. I mean, like for, we we needed a science course for our for our gen ed, and I took and I took children's literature as as my science course because it was technically it was technically a psychology class. Oh my god, that's awesome! Um, but I really like the fact that her taking a random poetry class like changed everything for her, um, and it was really. It was really moving that her professors were able to see her talent and really pushed for her to pursue it. And uh, I really like the scene where she's taking her first poetry class and her professor is reading the artichoke poem. And um, the class doesn't really understand the poem. They're like, why are we reading this? Like, what's the like? What is the meaning? Can't you just tell us what the poem means? Uh And her professor says, it's not meant to be given. It is a difficult grace. And that just made me think about Unji's mother's letters. Because it's like, you're going to be searching that letter for, I guess, like an apology. <laughs> and just like, just like an explanation for like why she decided to abandon her children. But you won't find it. You have to, you know, it's not just going to be given to you on a silver platter. You have to actually... Uh, take the time to look at each word and each meaning. And I thought that was like, um, I don't know, it was like a very poignant quote. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the themes of this book, right? Is the fact that like language isn't simple. Language holds layers and meaning, depending on who says it, when it's said, when it's read, and when it's, you know, understood. I really liked how uh, one of her advisors tells her, like you, you know, you have a gift for writing, but, you know, you you don't have to forgive your mother. I'm not telling you to forgive her, but the poem must forgive her or the poem must forgive you for not. Otherwise, it's not a poem. And, you know, her advisor tells her that you can like raw feelings on paper does not equal poetry. Like you need to have perspective, you need to have distance and um, it. And poetry really kicks off Unji's journey to forgive her mom. Yeah. Or not forgive, but at least like let go of um a lot of like the resentment and hurt that she's been carrying. Yeah. And I mean Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it also gives her like direction for the first time, right? Because, you know, she was really into dance, but it wasn't what she and what she wanted to do pursue right and she was thinking about dropping out from school before finding poetry yeah and um poetry really 
gives her the language. I know we keep saying language, but it's part of the title, title. (laughs) magical language of others. Poetry gives her a language where she could really express herself. Whereas like with Korean, Japanese and English, it always seems like she kind of compartmentalize a lot of her feelings and poetry becomes a language on its own for her to like really unpack a lot of the uh, feelings that she had locked up and it allows her to be free yeah. and yeah you re- you can really tell how much she loves poetry and how much she loves writing and and the gratitude that she found it yeah and that leads to her also picking up translation as a discipline as well in grad school right yeah um, you know that leads her to reflect on the act of translating which is you know not just literally translating the words from one language to another but finding the meaning and The fact that translating is also interpreting. Yeah, there's this wonderful line where she says translating means that she has to speak in her mother's voice when she is translating the letters. And uh, it gives it gives her perspective. It gets her inside her mother's head. And um, yeah, like translating becomes a really big part of her uh, process in in and forgiveness and also like forgiving herself for <laughs> for uh you know like holding on to that resentment um yeah, yeah. like her parents coming back to america oh my god after that nine part, years that part the part where her parents come back and immediately start questioning her choice of profession is such a quintessential like Asian American experience, especially for those of us who are in the creative arts. I mean, I get it like every time, <laughs> every time I speak with my parents, it is it is something that comes up. Um, obviously, like I'm <laughs> like I'm not an award winning poet. I am definitely like not up there in terms of skills. So I feel like with my parents telling me, what are you doing with your life? I feel like they have more ground. But <laughs> but with Unji's case, like, you know, she's, you know, she is teaching. She has her MFA and, you know, like that is her work. I love the part where her mom was bragging to her friends about Unji's like getting a house at the beach, but never really mentioning what she actually does. Well, her mom says like, you don't understand. My daughter teaches people to let go and you know like it's even though her parents are like you know like you're you're not going to be a poet forever blah 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 (laughs) uh even though they criticize her her career i think her mom really understands how much poetry has done for her um because like towards the end of the book like her mom says like you were always meant to be a poet and like i yeah like i said like i think her mother really understands what poetry has done for her uh, even though she criticizes, I guess, the the monetary success of it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like you mentioned, um, a lot of people read the letters and get upset about the mother. And I think it's interesting that um, Unji herself calls that out in her book because she has an anecdote about what I'm assuming is a white dude coming up to her after a reading and asking her, why isn't she more like mad at her mother for abandoning her? Yeah, I think that is I think that is a criticism that I've read most in in the Goodreads uh reviews. Um I'm looking at some of the comments that were made in our in our in our thread. And a lot of people said they they love this book. Uh Nina wrote, um, I really love this book, similar to Pachinko, Co told this story of generational trauma and ultimately lands on the power of forgiveness, and that forgiveness is something that can take place over a long period of time, potentially over the course of a lifetime. And yeah, I think that, I think that really sums it up, right? Like with uh, the white dude being like, "Hey, why do you, why are you not not why are you not madder at your mom for abandoning you?" And it's like it's not that simple. And uh, through poetry, through a number of years, uh, Unji was able to reach that level of peace. So, yeah, holding on to anger, it's tiring. At some point, you're just going to destroy yourself rather than. You know. Yeah, it's great to see that you know Unji was able to find a way to release those feelings through poetry, um, to a point where even if she's not fully over the things that happened to her, she can forgive her mother for her role in it. Yeah, um, I think 
I think this quote was in her mother's letter, and it was brought up by Harrison in our Goodreads forums, and he wrote, uh, I especially like the quote, if you love yourself, everything rolls along as it should. If you want to accomplish something, truly love yourself. And I think that's pretty much much what Unji did, right? Like, she went through a lot as a teenager, and... um there was a lot of self-doubt, and she really didn't know what direction she was taking, but poetry really gave her um, a way to release all of those feelings and uh, really learn to embrace herself and her identity. So, yeah, like, I think that quote is pretty poignant as well. Yeah, so as we draw this conversation to a close, um, any last thoughts about the magical language of others i think we were pretty thorough in our in our analysis of it especially as to you know children of immigrants um and this how book this is book is not that long by the way <laughs> this book is like what like 200 pages yeah um yeah like for for such a small book it carried so much is this the power of poetry maybe <laughs> maybe <laughs> um yeah. i like i said like Reading this book was a very personal and emotional journey for me. Um, I can only hope that I will find the piece that Unji found. It, and it is similar for me, like writing. Uh, I'm not so sure about it now, but um, when I was a teenager, when I was in college, writing helped me a lot. And it became a huge part of my identity. And I can understand her gratitude to poetry for helping her find a way to express herself and actually this this has nothing to do with the memoir but unji uh was the very first author i've ever interviewed so oh wow i interviewed her back in 2013 and this was when she was still in new york i think uh she had come out with a a novel uh I think it was a fantasy novel at the time, and you can't find it anywhere. It's it's gone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was my first time interviewing an author. It was my first time talking to an actual writer uh, who was not my professor. So I remember snippets from uh, what she talked about in her memoir. And it's crazy to me that nine, ten years since we've done that interview, like she has grown to be this magnificent writer. I don't know. I thought it was like a really weird coincidence because uh, <laughs> cause like EJ Co. I was like, oh, that's like the same name as the author I interviewed when I was like 21, 22. Um, but it's probably not her. But then I checked and I was like, oh, no, it is. Her. <laughs> oh, no, it is her. So uh, when I was reading the part in the book where she's in New York and she's doing her MFA. I was like, oh, this was around the time that I I like discovered her. So it's uh so so it's like a really weird meta thing that I went through reading this book. But wow. Just That's wanted amazing. to yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> reading this book put me in a reflective mood as well. You know, I started thinking about my own relationship with my parents and what are some ways that my dad being not around affected me and it's something that I've also discovered as I got older is once you start being able to actually talk to your parents as like fellow adults and gain the language to relate to them. You know, this book will mean different things to different people, but for people like me and people like us, I think there's like an extra layer that really, really that resonated with us. It's a secret language. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you, Anji Ko, for writing this amazing book um, and, you know, letting us feel things and reflect on our own lives. And yeah, I guess that'll, that'll do it for this discussion of The Magical Language of Others by E.J. Ko. If you've read the book, tell us your thoughts um, on our Goodreads forums. Um, we already have a discussion going there, but we always love to hear what our book club members think about our book club picks. And with that, Rira, we're doing something special for the month of February for our book club pick, right? Uh, yes, it's going to be our first collaboration episode. Yeah, we've been a we've been a book club podcast for what? Are we in year four? Year year five? Time has no meaning. 
I don't know. <laughs> we've been doing this um, for a very long time. Though. And we've been, you know, we've been antisocial for a long time. So we decided to branch out and, you know, work with other literary podcasts in our space. And yeah, so I'm excited about this, um, this new collaboration. Um, Rira, who are we working with and what are we reading? Uh, so we are going to collaborate with Colored Pages Book Club, which is hosted by Marcy and Akko. And we're going to be reading She of the Mountains by Vivek Shraya. And it's illustrated by Raymond Bisinger. Uh, hopefully I got those names correct. Um, it is a sequential art book or a graphic novel of sorts. And it explores uh, LGBTQ themes. Uh, some trigger warnings. There are some anti-gay rhetoric. And... Um, this book is actually, I think there's poetry in this book. It's categorized as poetry on Goodreads. Oh. So technically, this will be our this will be our first poetry book. How fitting wow. after we read a memoir <laughs> by by a poet and and her telling us the the magic of poetry. So now we're hey, it's reading not every poetry. day we have a first ever on Books and Bulbas. So it's it's two first ever's. We're collaborating with another podcast. And we're reading poetry for the first time, so. Yeah, yeah, so please join us in discussing that book. Like always, you can talk to us on Goodreads or on Twitter. Uh, we'd love to hear from you all. And that does it for our book club discussion for January 2021. Thank you so much for listening to us. Uh, Mira, as always, thank you for joining me in this magical adventure of Asian American books. Man, we really unpacked a lot. <laughs> Yeah. I think I think the people who, um, if this is your first episode listening to us, you probably learned pretty much, like you learned a lot about me from this one episode, <laughs> and I'm and I'm really like, did I say too much? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll see you next time. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Rira Yu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. Hey, I'm Bill Yu, and you may know me from a blog called Angry Asian Man. And I'm Jeff Yang, author, journalist, and celebrity dad. We host a podcast called They Call Us Bruce, an unfiltered conversation about what's happening in Asian America. Each week or so, we host a discussion about some of the most vital and interesting topics in our pop culture and our community, bringing in guests who are shaping and informing this thing called Asian America from Hollywood to D.C. and beyond. Uh, we've got media, entertainment, food, family, politics, representation, the good, the bad, the WTF of it all. So check us out wherever you get your podcasts or at theycallsbruce.com. Peace. Peace. Peace.